Uh, all right, so uh, good morning or good afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Jelani Nelson. Uh, Jelani is a professor of uh, electrical engineering and computer science at the University of California, uh, working in the area of uh, streaming and sketching algorithms. Uh, he has won several prestigious awards, uh, including a Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, a Sloan Research Fellowship, and several Best Paper Awards. Uh, Jelani is the creator of uh, Ad Discoder, uh, a computer science uh, summer program for Ethiopian high school students in uh, Adit Ababa. And uh, in the next 45 minutes, uh, he will uh, tell us about 40 years of frequent items. Take right, it away, thank Jelani. You. Thank you for the introduction. So what is this talk about? It's about the frequent items problem. I'll start off mostly talking about the streaming model and then toward the end, I'll talk about new models. <clears throat> it's also known as the heavy hitters problem or the approximate top K. So what's the setup? The setup is let's say there's a stream of items like say words that are being searched on Google, search, search queries. And I want an algorithm to monitor these as they come in. And then when I query the algorithm, it should, it should tell me which words have been searched frequently. So for example, maybe a lot of people search for the word wiki, because if you're like me, you don't use Wikipedia's internal search feature, you just search for wiki followed by whatever it is you want to see the wiki page of. So the setup is that you see a stream of items coming from some universe, so words coming from the dictionary, for example. And when someone says query, you have to report a small list L containing all the frequent items. What does frequent mean? It's parameterized by some positive integer k. And if the stream has length l, k frequent means it appears strictly more than l over k time. So strictly more than a one over k fraction of the time. So think top k. Anyone who satisfies this is definitely in the top k items by frequency. Um, although the converse is not necessarily true. And the goal is to use as little memory as possible. So the trivial solution is to maintain a histogram where for each word in the dictionary, you just remember how many times have I seen this word. So this, the amount of memory you would use there is proportional to the size of the dictionary. And the goal is to use much less than n memory, to use sublinear memory. And when someone says query, output such a small l uh, that has no false negatives. Anyone who is frequent, k frequent, must appear in l. But l might have a bounded number of false positives. So the size of l should be bounded. A harder problem is change detection. So uh, what, is, what does that mean? What is change detection? So let's say there's the search query stream from yesterday, and then there's the search query, query stream from today, or this is actually two days ago. <clears throat> and all of a sudden, you notice that, well, wiki is always popular every day. A lot of people always search for wiki. So for some, maybe somehow that makes wiki less interesting because it's always there. You want to notice the, the change in trends. So for example, on July 9th, all of a sudden, many more people started searching for the term HOB. And this is a real thing. If I, you know, I just saw this, uh, I just added this slide yesterday. So um, I went to google.com slash trends and I saw one of the most popular search terms was HOV or HOV lane. And I searched for it myself, HOV lane. So basically for those who don't, you know, not in the US, the US recently, uh, the Supreme Court recently uh, reinterpreted the constitution and said, actually, uh, you know, the Supreme Court basically ended the, the federal protections for abortion rights. And then one, one woman in Texas said, great, you, you want to end my right to abortion, then now I can use the HOV lane for high occupancy vehicles because I'm pregnant and my, you're saying my baby is a person. So the two of us now satisfy the rules to use the, the carpool lane. Okay, so anyway, and now she's taking them to court for that. Um, so you know you can notice you can notice change in, in search trends and frequency by by like by using such algorithms for change detection, and of course I say it's a harder problem because if you have something that can solve change detection, you can definitely solve frequent items. Just tell the algorithm that yesterday was the empty stream, nothing happened, and that today is today, um, and then the difference between today and yesterday becomes today because yesterday had nothing, right? So it's a strictly harder problem to solve than change detection. Um, all of this fits into something called turnstile streaming algorithms, which is even more general. So there, there's a high dimensional vector Z that starts with the zero vector. Think of Z as the histogram. Um, and there's a sequence of updates that say, add some amount delta to some entry of Z. So ZI gets to be ZI plus delta. For example, in frequent items, delta is always plus one. Every time you see an item I, you add one to its frequency. In change detection, everything yesterday is a minus one update. Everything today is a plus one. 
And then of course, ZI at the end of yesterday and today is gonna to be the difference between today and yesterday. And you wanna find people who have large magnitude. So that's chain detection. And then a query asks for some function of Z midstream. There are many things that people look for, uh, many types of queries that people ask. Distinct elements is also another old one that people ask, which is just how many distinct elements that I see in the stream, which is just the support size of the histogram Z. There are others as well. Today, we're focusing on the frequent query. Return a list that doesn't miss any of the frequent items. It contains all the heavy hitters, HH is heavy hitters, of bounded size, L should be bounded size. And for many algorithms, you need, for many functions that you need money for compute, you need both approximation and randomization to achieve small memory. So again, back to today's problem. An index I is frequent or heavy hitter. Those are synonyms. If the frequency of item I is more than a one over K fraction of the L1 norm of the stream, which is just the sum of all frequencies, which if there are no deletions is just the length of the stream. Okay, we already said what it means to do a frequent query, output a small list containing all the heavy hitters. Now, now that I've written in terms of norms, you might look at this L1 norm and say, huh, he put an L1 norm there. I mean, it's natural to put an L1 norm there because if there are no deletions, the L1 norm is just the length of the stream. But does it make sense to put other functions there, other norms? So if, if one instead defined a K heavy hitter as an index I such that, let's say, ZI cubed is more than a one over K fraction of the L3 norm cubed, the sum of all the other J, uh, items J of ZJ cubed. And on top of that, uh, on the right-hand side there, let's say I exclude the top K items by frequency. So I, you know, I'm summing only from J equals K plus one to N where J, I, Z star is basically Z, but sorted in decreasing order by magnitude. So I exclude the top K. So if you define a K heavy hitter in this way, you can show that this actually approaches the top K at, for when the weighting function is the P of power and P goes to infinity. So instead of cubed, if you say to the, to the hundredth power, you just make P as large, you know, larger and larger, it, it, be, it approaches the top K. And once P is large enough, it is the top K. Okay. Um, so that means that you want to solve P as large as possible if you want to solve the top K problem. If you view frequent items as some kind of relaxation of top K, then the larger P is, the better the, re, the, better the relaxation, the closer it is to the true top K problem. But there's a, there's a, a theorem from 2002, 20 years ago, that says once p is larger than two, solving this version of the problem actually requires polynomial space in n. Okay, so if you're trying to get away with subpolynomial space, polylogarithmic space, for example, basically the best relaxation you could hope to solve is the case where p equals two. Um, so just keep that in mind because we're going to talk a little bit more about p equals two soon. So as the title of the talk suggests, 40 years of frequent items have been there has been at least 40 years of work on this problem. Probably the most, <clears throat> uh, the most obvious one is just to sample. What do I mean by that? Look, um, if, if an item is really that frequent, it's a one over K fraction of the stream, then if I sample just a subset of the stream, a subsequence in the stream, then I expect the item to still be a one over K fraction in the subsequence. <clears throat> okay. um, but is it actually gonna be a one over K fraction? No, there's some deviation, right? There's some variance there. And in order to notice it, I better sample at least K squared items because then my, um, yeah, then, I'll, you know, it'll still, it'll still be noticed, you know, we can prove just by like Chebyshev's inequality by looking at the second moment that if I sample at least K squared items, I'll still be able to see it in the sample. But then uh, something better than that is actually a deterministic algorithm from exactly 40 years ago. Um, this is the first published paper on the problem. The frequent algorithm due to Mishra and Grease gives a deterministic algorithm, not randomized, that only uses K memory instead of K squared. And it solves the frequent problem for the L1 version, which is the version I first stated in this talk. And since then, there's been a lot of work. It really took off more in the early 2000s after streaming became more popular. Um, and not all of these are, it's not some linear improvement. It's not like the next bullet is always improving the previous bullet. Um, some of them look at different versions of the problem. Like I could look at the L1 version versus the L2 version versus does it support change detection or not? Um, so, you know, there, there's some apples and oranges here. Is it deterministic or is it randomized? So in this talk, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about maybe the two most recent uh, algorithms here. Um, the expander sketch and the BP tree. And then after I give a little overview of those, I'll talk about new models for the problem. So the BP tree is 
what's its what's its thing that it uh, provides? It's a randomized algorithm for insertion only L2 heavy hitters, basically not change detection. So all the updates are plus ones. Um, there are no deletions. And amongst all L2 versions of the amongst all algorithms that solve the L2 version in insertion only, it has the best known memory consumption. Okay, asymptotically. And the expander sketch is a randomized algorithm for a generalist turn style. That means it supports deletions. It can solve change detection, for example. It also solves the most powerful L2 version, the tightest relaxation of top K. And amongst all such algorithms, it has simultaneously the best known memory, update time, failure probability, and query time. Okay. Query time means when I ask you, give me the list of heavy hitters, how long does it take to produce that list, given the data structure, given the algorithm uh, memory state? Okay, so there are other algorithms that can match it on some subset of these four items, but it, you know, if you want, but it's the only one that gets kind of the best of all four simultaneously. So let's start, let's start talking about the algorithms. First, I'll talk about the BP tree. Okay, the first one. <clears throat> so the very first algorithm for this problem was from 20 years ago called the count sketch. And it uses K log N words of memory. Remember, N is the size of the universe and K and want the approximate top K. And there was an improvement in 2016. And then now the BP tree uses K log K words of memory. Remember, I'm trying to find the top K. So K is the top K out of N, out of a universe of size N, right? So K is definitely less than N. Otherwise, the problem doesn't make any sense. So K log K is better than K log N. This is a, this an algorithm uh, for this uses better memory than the count sketch. <clears throat> and it's still an open problem whether or not you can get O of K words of memory instead of K log N, instead of K log K. Okay, so now let me talk a little bit about how the data structure works. So the plan of attack is as follows. Remember now, uh, a heavy hitter, a frequent item, is one who's under L2, whose squared frequency is more than, let's say, 0.1 times the sum of all the other squares. <clears throat> that, would be, that would be when K is 10. Okay. Um, in the super heavy problem, I, I'll say an item is super heavy if its squared frequency is more than 1,000 times bigger than the sum of the squares of all the other items. So it's not just 1% of the stream in, <clears throat> in an L2 sense or 10% or 0.1%. Or it's actually 99.999% or something. Okay, So a super heavy item is one that's almost the entire stream in an L2 sense. And then we use a reduction from prior work that says, um, <clears throat> if you want to find all the heavy hitters, it suffices to reduce to the super heavy problem. Basically, if there exists a super heavy item, I find it with probably 90%. If there is no super heavy item, then you're allowed to output some arbitrary output. And then you show that via this reduction, if you can solve super heavy in space S, the final algorithm will have space S times K log K. And then we're going to show how to solve super heavy in constant memory. So the overall memory is K log K. So the reduction is basically some hashing trick. So um, whenever you see an item I in the stream, first of all, you instantiate Q copies of an algorithm that solves super heavy, where Q is some large constant times K. And when you see an item I in the stream, you hash it to a random one of those copies, and that's and you process it there. And that's it. And the point is, look, if, if I is just a heavy hitter, if it's like, say, 1% of the stream, then in the bucket it lands in, it's, of course, still at, at least 1% of the bucket, because the bucket only has a subset of the stream. Right, so if it's one percent of the whole thing, it better, it's it's going to be definitely at least one percent of, of a small subset. But since items are getting randomly mapped to these buckets, it's probably going to be even heavier in its bucket because there's le there are less other items in the bucket. And if you know, basically, you can analyze this, and then say that he's going to be super heavy with constant probability. But I don't just want to find one heavy hitter; I want to find all of them. So a constant fraction of them will be super heavy, but I want to find them all with high probability. So what do I do? I basically repeat this log k times so that I can say, look, any given item in one row of this picture, in one row of this grid, yes, I'll find he'll be super heavy with constant probability. But just by a turnoff bound, if you repeat log k times or log k rows here, uh, every heavy hitter will be super heavy in a constant fraction of the rows with good probability. Okay, so if you just find the people who are super heavy in a constant fraction of the rows, that, that'll work. Now, how do you actually find super heavy? The super heavy items. We're going to make use of a core lemma that we prove, which says that if you have an evolution of a vector updated in an insertion only stream, what does it mean that it's 
a vector updated in its original stream. So these y, these y superscript j's, that's basically the, the, the histogram at time j, after I've processed j items in the stream. So initially the histogram is zero because I haven't seen anything. And every time I see an item, it's like I add one. If I see an item i, I add one to the ith entry of the vector. So if you look at the difference between some yj and yj plus one, the difference is that some coordinate got incremented by one. So there are differences. The difference between successive vectors here is always some standard basis vector. Okay, so that's the evolution of a vector of a histogram updated insertion only stream. And you take sigma <clears throat> to be a random uh, vector of Rademachers, um, but only pseudo random, so that the entries are not actually independent, but they're only four wise independent. If I look at any four of them at a time, they look independent. And the reason for that is, as you're going to see in the algorithm, we're going to want to store sigma in memory, but storing sigma in memory naively would take n bits because it's a big random vector. But if it's pseudo random, it turns out we know from computer science um, previous work that for such pseudo random sigma that are only four wise independent, you can actually you can actually generate them using only O of log n random bits and store them in o of only O of log n bits. Which when I said a word, a word <clears throat> words are big enough that they can store indices into vectors like this. So it's only a constant number of words of memory. Okay, then anyway. The, the lemma says that the expectation over this choice of sigma of the largest dot product between sigma and any one of the yt's is, a, is at most a constant times the L2 norm of the final y. And the proof sketch is that it uses a Dudley type chaining argument with four y's independent tail bounds instead of the usual Dudley argument with sub Gaussian tails. Okay. If you want, just so I can make this one a little more concrete so you, you can see an example of what the heck this means. Um, just imagine that the stream is just one, two, three, four, five, et cetera. Then Y superscript T is just a histogram of what you saw, right? So the first T items in the stream, the first T things in the universe have ones because you saw them each once and everything else is zero. So sigma dot Y T is just a prefix sum of the first T little T entries in sigma, which is the same thing as the position X T of a random walk on the integers starting at zero after T times steps. Okay. So I start at the origin and every time step, I either walk left with probability half or walk right with probability half. And I just look at the evolution of this random walk on, on the integers. Then we know it's called, you know, these maximal inequalities. The maximum deviation from the origin and expectation after capital T time steps is at most some constant times square root capital T. This is better than the naive thing. The naive thing would be a tail bound followed by a union bound. And that would get you something like square root T times square root log T. But it turns out you don't need the skirt log t. This is the maximum inequality. There are some very simple proofs of this fact when the entries of sigma are independent. But our entries of sigma are not independent, right? We generalize that in two ways. We generalize the maximum inequality in two ways. One is that the sigma i only need to be four y's independent, so that it's pseudo random. And the other is that the y's are an arbitrary evolution of a stream. You can have, you know, it doesn't necessarily, the stream doesn't have to be one, two, three, four, five. You can have the same token as from repeated and the lemma still holds. Okay. Now, how do you use the core lemma to design an algorithm? So wishful thinking, let's say we knew the final norm of the stream exactly. So ZL is the stream frequency, the hist frequency histogram at time L. <clears throat> and let's say capital H is the ID of the super heavy item, which is, you know, it's a number between one and N, so it's a log N bit integer. We're gonna try to learn this log N bit integer bit by bit. Let's say from the zeroth bit to the log N bit. How are we gonna learn, say, the zeroth bit? We're gonna pick sigma at random from a four wise independent family and store it. This is why it's four wise independent. If we're fully independent, storing it would be very expensive and we can't afford that. We're gonna instantiate two counters, C0 and C1. And when we see an item I in the stream, let's say 14, we write I in binary. We look at the zeroth bit of I in binary because we're trying to learn H0, the zeroth bit of H. And we say, oh, 14 ends with a zero in binary. So we're gonna update C0. We're gonna add sigma 14 to it. Okay? And that basically is the algorithm. That's basically how you process updates. Now, why is this a sensible thing to do? So for the sake of illustration, let's suppose that the super heavy item actually ended with a one in binary. What's gonna be in C1? It's gonna be the frequency of item H, ZH, times its random sign. So that's why there's a plus minus, plus, the sum of all other i's in the stream that are not h, such that they also end with a one in binary of sigma i z i. And then c0 will be sigma dotted with the, with the even indexed items, the ones who end with a zero in binary. Now, super heaviness says that, you know, <clears throat> at the end of the stream, 
the L2 number of the stream is basically the same thing as the frequency of the super heavy IM because it's, the super heavy IM is almost everything in L2 sets. And remember, we know that by wishful thinking, we know the L2 number at the end of the stream, which means we know the final number of occurrences of the super heavy item that we expect. So we're going to wait until one of these buckets, uh, one of these counters is bigger than in magnitude the final frequency of the super heavy item divided by 10, 10% of the occurrences of super, super heavy item. And then we'll just declare that we learned that. Oh, if, if it's the jth counter, if it's counter J that got to be that big, we'll just declare that the super heavy item must, uh, its zeroth bit must be J. And then, you know, to argue that this is correct, we'll apply the core lemma twice, once to each counter, right? So basically, if you look at those two summations that are highlighted in blue, the core lemma says that basically none of them will ever be big, right? Over all time steps, the expectation of the soup over all time steps of those two dot products is small. They're never big. In particular, C0 is always small, so it'll never be bigger than ZH over 10. So I'll never think that it's zero. And um, once, Z, once, once I've seen H enough times in the stream so that ZH gets to be big, the point is since the blue sum in C1 is never big, it's always small, it will, even if it has opposite sign of ZH, it won't be able to significantly, significantly cancel the mass of ZH because it's so small. So once ZH becomes big, C1 will be big because the blue sum in C1 will not have a chance to cancel the ZH. Okay. So that's basically the core lemma applied twice, once to each blue sum, to say that once I've seen H enough times, I will actually declare correctly that it's the super heavy item, the good probability. So that's how to learn. That's how to learn one bit. You need a few more ideas to learn all log n bits, not just one. And also, you, you know, you need to remove this assumption that you know the L two number at the end of the stream, which you don't. But these are all things that can be dealt with, and I'm not going to talk about them today for, due to lack of time. So let's talk about the other algorithm, which is the expander sketch. Remember, what's the what's the <clears throat> what's the point of this algorithm? The point of this algorithm is that it does support deletions. You can actually solve the chain deduction problem. So actually that algorithm from 20 years ago, the count sketch could also solve this. It uses uh, uh, K log N words of memory. It's update time. The time it takes to process a token in the stream is log N and update in the stream is log N time. It's query time. When you say, give me the list of heavy hitters, it's query time is N log N. Which if you think N is the size of the universe or N is the set number of words in the dictionary, N is very large. N log N is not a very attractive query time. I'm only trying to find a list of, top, of the top K. I think K is 100. I want to find the top 100 items. I really want runtime that is proportional to 100, not proportional to the size of the universe. So there were some works um, in 05 and 08 that could basically trade off either query time or space, or either update time or <clears throat> space uh, for query time. So the dyadic countman sketch used k log squared n words in memory with log squared n update time. Uh, so those are both, both worse than the count sketch, but the query time is, is proportional to k right, instead of n. So it's k times log squared n instead of n times probably log n. And then the, the hierarchical countman sketch matches asymptotically up to a constant factor of the same memory and update time as the count sketch, but its query time is a very small polynomial, n to the point one. So the expander sketch's contribution is that it gets everything kind of at the same time, k log n space, log n update time, and query time proportional to k. And two of these have asterisks, the middle two. They only work for what's called the strict turn style model, and they don't work for L2, they only work for L1. Jargon, what does strict turn style mean? It means that the updates, you know, add delta to the ith entry in the turn style model, add delta to the ith entry in the histogram. Well, delta can be positive or negative, but I never allow ZI to be negative. So I can never delete an item if it hasn't already been inserted. So that's strict turn style. So our, you know, our contribution, this expander sketch, it does work for general turn style not strict, not just strict. It also works for L2, but in the talk, I'll just focus on strict turn style L1 because it's simpler to describe while conveying, conveying the main ideas. <laughs> okay, so the problem, right, if you look at prior work, the problem is, well, like the count min sketch or the count sketch, these algorithms are actually great, you know, great memory, great update time, but the query time is slow, it's n log n, right? It's linear, it's roughly linear in the size of the universe or in the length of the vector. 
well, what if the length of the vector was not n? What if the length of the vector was u, poly, which is poly log n? Then you know, linear in, linear in the vector length or linear in the, in the universe size would actually be linear in poly log n, right? So that would be great. So we want to reduce the case where the universe size is small, right? Of course, the inverse size is not small, it's n. You want to re reduce the case where it is. In order to do that, we're first going to reduce the case where k is small. And then we're going to show how to solve the case when k is small. I'm not going to show how to reduce the case when k is small. It's not very complicated, but I'll skip it due to time. So how do you solve the case when k is small? So this is what we do. So let's say that you have an update, which is add some delta, some v to the 29th entry. I'm going to write 29 in binary. And then I'm going to... I'm going to break up the binary representation into chunks, m chunks, where m is log n, roughly log n over log log n. Now, this is a log n bit integer, right? So there are log n bits here. I'm going to break it into log n over log log n chunks, where each chunk has length log log n, right? T, each chunk has length t, which is proportional to log log n. And the point, and then what I'm going to do is when I see an update, I'm going to feed each chunk separately into a different Countman sketch data structure. So there's a chunk, there's a data structure P1 for the first chunk, P2 for the second chunk, P3 for the third chunk. These are each heavy hitters data structures, but they're operating over smaller indices, right? Instead of the original six bit integer, P1 is only receiving a two bit input. And, you know, so now from the perspective of P1, what's the universe size? Well, it's two to the two, right? Because it's a bit, it's a bit string of length two. So there are only two of the two bit strings of length two. So in general, if it's a T length bit string, only two of the T possible inputs. So it's operating over a small universe. And since T is O of log log N, two to the T is poly log N. So it's operating over a universe of size poly log N. So when you query it, it's fast. And the basic idea is, look, if I is frequent, if it's a heavy hitter, then the J chunk is heavy in PJ for all J, right? Because every time I, if 29 is heavy, Every time I see 29, P1 sees 0, 01, right? So the heaviness of 0, 01 is at least equal to the heaviness of 29 in the whole stream from the perspective of P1. And because it's strict turnstile in L1, right? Strict turnstile means that, well, there are some other items that also begin with a 0, 01 in binary, but no item ever has negative, a negative uh, frequency. So they don't cancel, they only add to you. And since it's L1, my notion of heaviness is the sum. Okay. And then now when I say query, I want most of all the heavy hitters, I'll just query <clears throat> each PJ for a list LJ if it's heavy chunks, and then I'll simply concatenate them. P1 will say 0, 1, P2 will say 1, 1, P3 will say 0, 1. I simply concatenate these. There are, two, there are a couple of problems here. One of them is that the PJs fail, so we're missing some chunks, right? These are randomized data structures. So maybe like 10% of the PJs fail, and then I'm missing 10% of the bits. That's easy to fix. I simply use an error correcting code. So I'm not going to get into that, but there are tools from coding theory that let you do this and they let you do them fast, in particular, something called expander codes. That's not why it's called the expander sketch. A more serious issue is that there's not just one heavy hitter, there are k heavy hitters, right? And k is, now we reduce the case where k is O of log n. They're, at mo they're up to log n heavy hitters. So P1 is not just going to output one, 0, 1, it's going to output log n different bit strings. P2 is going to op output log n different bit strings, et cetera. I don't know who to concatenate with who. That's, that's a serious issue. So what we suggested doing was take one, which didn't work, was feed the update, which is take the error correcting code applied to I, so in the encoding of I, take the J chunk of that together with the update V and add that, give that to PJ for each J. That didn't work because we didn't know how to match chunks to concatenate. This has a connection to something called list recoverable codes from coding theory, which I won't recover here, but if only we had those, if only we had good list recoverable codes, this problem would be solved. Unfortunately, there are no explicit constructions of such codes that are good enough for this for our purposes today. So yeah, so we have to do that, fix this another way. <clears throat> and the idea is to add <clears throat> a few uh, a few a few extra bits, some metadata to the index for, for this concatenation purpose. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick a random hash function. Just think of a random function h j for each, j is the chunk I, the, ch the chunk index. So there, remember there are, there are t chunks, right? Each one of log log n bits. I'm oh, sorry, there are m chunks. M is log n over log log n. Each chunk has t bits, so there are m chunks. I'm going to have m random functions h1, h2 up to h m. Each one maps the universe, which is of size n, into a random into a range <clears throat> of size poly log n randomly or pseudo randomly, so I can store H. 
And what I'm going to feed to PJ is not simply the jth chunk of the encoding, but the jth chunk of the encoding where I also concatenate the jth random function applied to I, as well as the J plus first random function applied to I. So now the point is when PJ tells me the jth chunk of bits, I also know its random name at, in chunk J, as well as its random name in chunk J plus one. So when I also get the, the bits from chunk J plus one, I know, oh, this, these random names match up and I can concatenate these two chunks. So basically it tells me what my random name will be in the next chunk so I can concatenate. So the picture is something like this. After I do all the queries, I basically get back a graph, which ideally should look like uh, K vertex and joint paths, one per heavy hitter, right? So P1 basically tells me the first row. It tells me, oh, uh, the heavy hitter, the heavy, the heavy, uh, the first chunk of bits for the heavy hitters are these white bits, these yellow bits, and these blue bits. And I also tell you the random name of those heavy hitters in, the, in P2. And P2 says, oh, well, um, you know, the, there are these, for the second chunk, the, 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 the bits of the heavy hitters are these white bits, these yellow bits, these blue bits. And since I know the random names, I can match them together. And I, I know that white is white and yellow is yellow and blue is blue, and I can cat them together. This assumes though that kind of all the chunks are good. What does it mean? What do I mean by that? I'll say that a chunk is good, or it'd be a chunk between one and M, an index between one and M, J is good. If PJ succeeds, it's a randomized data structure. HJ perfectly hashes all the frequent items in chunk J, meaning that they all get, um, they're all mapped injective, injectively by, by HJ. <clears throat> and also there are no spurious heavy hitters uh, created by light items colliding. And you can, sh it's an easy lemma to, that, to show that with high probability, 99.9% .9 of the levels J are good. The problem is that the bad levels might mess up this graph picture. So for example, let's say that levels two and three were bad. If levels, if the levels are bad, who knows what might happen, right? It, I might get the wrong random names and then concatenate the wrong people together. Or if P3 is bad, I might simply, you know, <clears throat> get the wrong names out of P3 and some vertices might disappear from P3. P P3 might not output some heavy bits that it, uh, some have some heavy chunks that it should have or two people if, if a level is bad two people might think that the random name is the same thing in the next level and then i have two paths to lighting like this right so who knows what could happen so how are we going to fix this well the problem is that bad levels might script the graph and the fix is to note that look the reason we really are having this problem is that we connected chunks together using a path basically um our picture, our graph looked like K vertex disjoint paths. Okay, so the, the basic graph here was the path. Each heavy hitter was represented as a path. And somehow the path was not robust to these, these kinds of screw ups. Instead, rather than represent a heavy hitter as a path, we should represent it as a graph that's robust to screw ups. And we're gonna use expander graphs, which are graphs that are just very well connected. And we, what we actually do, motivated by some work that was in compressed sensing, is we pick a regular expander on M vertices. Okay, let's call that F. So basically one vertex per chunk, just like the path, the path was supposed to be a path of length M, right? So the path was a path on M vertices. We're gonna pick an expander on M vertices. And then let's say that the expanders of item J in the, the, the neighbors of item J and vertex J in the expander are gamma J1 up to gamma JD, it's D regular. What I'm going to feed to PJ is now not just the jth chunk of the encoding, but I'm also going to feed again my random name in level J, as well as my random name at every neighbor in the expander. So basically, I'm now representing each heavy hitter not as a path, but as an expander graph. And I want to keep, <clears throat> again, I still want to have a small universe size. So I want PJ to receive O of log log n bits which means I want the degree of the expander to be a constant, right? So that overall, this entire concatenation is still over log log n bits. So I want a constant degree expander. So now again, how do I answer uh, heavy hitters queries? Well, <clears throat> ideally my graph, which I construct after, you know, by concatenating things together should be uh, K vertex disjoint copies of some expander graph, right? And if nothing messed up at all, if it's actually vertex disjoint copies of an expander graph, I'll find my graph G, I'll do a depth first search or something, find the connected components, 
you know, some of the, some of the uh, bits are messed up because of the PJs failing. That's fine. I, I have my error correcting code. I can decode. The problem is that I can't just do a depth first search and find connected components because when the graph screws up, components might become disconnected. They might, they might fuse together and things like that, right? So two vertices might get glued together when things go wrong. I might have bogus vertices enter, which have edges to real vertices. Um, some PJs fail and some vertices might get deleted. Some edges might get deleted or in falsely inserted. So basically the bottom line is that what G will actually look like is K vertex destroying copies of an expander, but with a small amount of per perturbation, right? So that some of the, some of the, some of the copies of, of F have spurious edges connecting them to each other. Okay. But F internally is going to be much more tightly connected. It's an expander than these spurious few edges that are connecting it to the rest of the graph. And I want to identify the Fs, most of the Fs. For each F, I want to identify most of the vertices of that F. And this is really a graph clustering problem. And you know, it can be solved using spectral clustering techniques, which I'm not going to get into today, but uh, for due to lack of time. So basically, this whole everything I've said so far about expander sketch is just basically one giant reduction. To a, to a graph clustering problem, which is solved using techniques like involving things like cheaters and equality, for example. So that's it for the, those two algorithms. What's next for heavy hitters? Well, one is new models. <clears throat> so a model that's relevant for today is, um, <clears throat> you know, probably many of you have a smartphone, right? I have a smartphone. And when we use our smartphones, we, we often depend on, <clears throat> um, some nice features of the smartphone, things like autocomplete, right? So I'm, I'm typing a sentence and then my phone predicts that the next word that I wanna type based on what I've typed so far. And also automatic spell correction. So I misspelled a word here and the phone yelled at me and said, actually, I think you wanna type this word, not the typo that you typed. Okay, so, <clears throat> um, you know, in order to provide features like these two features, there is some machine learning going on. Okay, like it's uh, the phone manufacturer, the phone vendor is collecting a bunch of data, feed, you know, about like how people text, feeding that data into train machine learning models, and then the machine learning models can provide these kinds of features for us. Okay. So the server wants to know the data. So, for example, let's say there are n, phone, n uh, iPhone users out there, or some other phone. And the server wants to know things like, what's the word distribution amongst the phones? How many devices just, just texted the word X, right? Or maybe the universe is not just words, but pairs of words. How many devices just texted the word X followed by the word Y? So basically now your universe size would be N squared or something like that. Okay. And from collecting this kind of data, it can then feed, you know, feed these histograms into whatever downstream machine learning trainers and then get good uh, features for us. And again, there's a histogram, right? ZX is just how many devices just text the word X. Sounds simple enough, right? Whenever you text your friend, you simply send a carbon copy of that text to the server. So the server sees all the data. Of course, that doesn't fly because of privacy. Do you really want phone manufacturers to read all your text? Probably not. The basic idea is to send randomized messages like add noise. So here's an example of that. Here's, uh, let's say my text, my message is actually an image. I just text an image to my friend. My original image is me from my, uh, baby shower and my first child was about to be born. We we're playing some game. I was drinking from a baby bottle. Um, and here's the actual image. And then I can add noise to that image to make it harder and harder to see what's really going on in the image. The bottom right, I added more noise, maybe with a ton of noise, okay. And the idea is in the left-hand side, let's say there are 25 phone users out there and each one is texting different images, but maybe many of them, many of them are texting this image of me drinking from a bottle. And what I want the server to be able to do is to be able to take those 25 messages from 25 different phones and notice, hey, a popular thing that a lot of people are texting is this picture of Jelani drinking from a bottle. Now, I can't actually tell which of those 25 people are texting this image. I can just tell that it's a popular thing that's being texted without actually being able to identify who texted it. That would be like some notion of privacy. So the moral of the story of what I want is I want each individual message to look like random noise, random garbage, thus protecting privacy, but where the server can still extract useful knowledge by aggregating messages from all devices. But what exactly does privacy mean? And you have to be careful because if I take that same, you know, if I take that same kind of uh, 
idea. Well, here I really, really on the left noisify the image. This is not just a, a fake picture. I, I really did. I really took that. I really took that image of myself and really noisified it heavily. And then I applied some algorithm from signal processing called wavelet denoising. It doesn't really matter today what that is. But on the right hand side, that's the image. After, that's the noisified image after I applied wavelet denoising. And you can you can really tell that it's you know a person. Maybe you can't tell it's me. I mean almost. But um, you know you can tell it's a person holding up a drink and drinking, and they're wearing a, a jacket with some with a collar, right? It, there's a lot of information you're learning just from a single noisified message, and that's not private. Okay? I haven't defined what privacy means, but you shouldn't be able to learn anything from a single message or very little from a single message. Okay? You only are learning in the aggregate from lots of users, not just from one user. So this this would not be private. So you have to be careful with the definition. You have to mathematically define what privacy means and then prove theorems that you're actually, your, your algorithm actually satisfies that definition of privacy. So we use something called local differential privacy. So a device sends a random message that's only weakly correlated with the data as I suggested. One individual's device looks like random noise but the server can extract signal from the aggregate, okay? But what's the privacy definition? I see a scheme provides epsilon differential privacy if for all devices I and all possible messages M, and for all data, X not equal to X prime. So X is like a picture of me drinking from a bottle and X prime is some totally different thing. X prime is a picture of a cat. Okay? So two different data items. The probability that you send this given message, given that it's a picture of me with a bottle versus the probability that you send this particular message, given that it's a picture of a cat, those two probabilities should be close to each other. You know, ideally their ratio should be one. If their ratio is one, that's perfect privacy. It's like the problem you send this message has nothing to do with the data. It's always the same, and which is, you know, per, which intuitively is perfectly private. If your message distribution has nothing to do with the data, that's private. But the problem is that then the server doesn't learn anything. So if I say that the ratio is at most e to the epsilon, well, epsilon equals zero is perfect privacy because e to the zero is one. But if I start to increase epsilon, I start to sacrifice a little bit of privacy. But now you can hope the server can learn something because the distributions are actually slightly different. There's two regimes in, to keep in mind, small and large epsilon. Usually what's the point employed in practice is epsilon a small constant, like five or six. There are good reasons for that, which I think I'm gonna skip for today. Um, so the setup is each device holds some data from the universe, which implies a frequency histogram. And the server wants to recover a histogram that's close, a so small mean squared error. Let's say the X, you know, I want Z minus Z tilde to be smaller than L2 more. I want to minimize a few things. One is privacy loss. I want epsilon to be as close to zero as possible. I want the, the utility to the server to be as good as possible, small utility loss. So the different, the error, the L2 norm between Z and Z till is small. Small communication, small server time to run time to actually produce the histogram and uh, small device time, time it takes to produce my message. I want all five to be small simultaneously. There's a meta approach for this problem, which is, as I'll describe the meta approach briefly. So there's some message space Y and I'll associate, basically messages always come from message space. And I'll associate with each X some subset of message space of some fixed size a little S. And I call that subset the preferred message list. And I'll rig it so that all the intersections of preferred message lists over different data items always have the same size. And the mechanism is that for any message, I'll send that message with probability P if it's not a preferred message for X and with probability E to the epsilon P if it is a preferred message. So this is differentially private by construction because all probabilities only differ by an E to the epsilon factor. The probability that I send something has to be one, which basically means P has to be something for this to make any sense. And I'll use some kind of linear estimator. Uh, basically, then the server side, if I want to estimate the frequency of item X, I'll just say, look, for each message which is preferred for X, I'll add alpha plus beta to a counter. And if it's not preferred, I'll only add beta. And in order for this to be an unbiased estimator, basically, I know alpha and beta have to be something. This is completely determined. And then there's a you don't have to follow what's happening on this slide, but basically in terms of the combinatorial properties of this set collection, I can calculate what the mean squared error, the expected mean squared error is. And the punchline is that I want basically small intersection sizes of the sets as a, as a fraction of the set sizes. And I also want small ratio of message, message space size to S. And it's completely now a combinatorial question, which you can solve using projective geometry, okay? And let me skip exactly how that works, but it's some, it's some projective geometry over finite fields to, to basically construct this thing. And 
And we did that. And basically what you can get is you can get the optimal utility loss with the best known communication and fast run times. Okay. And let me skip some plots. The plots basically say we implemented this. It's good. It's also pretty fast in practice. And to make it fast, we use some dynamic programming, which I'm going to skip, but it's implementable and the code is online. This is the implementation of the algorithm. So this is actually not just in theory, this is a practical algorithm. Um, it's also possible to trade off the speed for <clears throat> runtime for utility loss, which I'm not going to get into. And that's the end of my talk. Uh, and thank you. I believe I'm now out of time.